Hi, everybody. I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy specialist at the Maine State Library. And tonight we're going to talk about tracing your Irish ancestors. And um, this is the first of a series that's going to go through the end of June with a couple little spring breaks in there about various places and ethnic groups where you may have ancestors. I'm going to try to make it interesting enough that even if you don't think you have ancestors in a particular place, that you still would be interested in hearing what we have to say. So let me do this. Let me share my screen. And okay, are you seeing my screen now? Okay. We've got things overlapping here that shouldn't be. Okay, now we're set. So when we talk about genealogy research in Ireland, the first thing we need to actually do is talk about, whoops, wrong thing. What is Ireland? And basically there's this island to the west of England and it's right now divided between two countries. I'm only going to talk about Irish history as it um, relates to genealogical records, because otherwise we'd be here till well after midnight. Um, and this island was under English rule for several centuries. So some of what we're going to see tonight are records that are very similar to records we'll see again when we do um, the program on English genealogy. And some of the structures in place, like the fact that the Church of Ireland, which is part of the Anglican Communion, was the established church in Ireland um, until 1871. And that's going to come back around when we, in a few minutes, when we talk about what happened because the because it was the established church, the church records were considered documents of state. They were government records. So anyhow, um, most of Ireland had stayed Catholic at the Reformation, um, ruled by Protestant England. And so you get the Catholic hierarchy was expelled just before 1700. Local parish priests could stay if they registered with the English authorities. But anyone who was higher up in the hierarchy was expelled, which means that a huge chunk of the really well-educated priests and cardinals and such were expelled from the country. And then in 1704, there was a, an act passed in England that prevented the further growth of what they called popery or you know, popish, papist, otherwise Catholic you know, families. And this includes Catholics were not allowed to buy land. They could not inherit it from a Protestant or have a lease that was more than 31 years when the average lease at that point was three generations. Um, and if a Catholic family already owned land, it had to be divided equally among all the male heirs. So all of someone's sons. And so if they had a, um, a uh, brain cramp here, um, an estate, say, of 100 acres, they'd have, and they had eight sons, they'd have to divide it eight ways. And that means that after a couple of generations, you get down onto very small plots of land. Um, and so that was the status for quite a while. In the 1800s, 19th century, you get the beginnings of land reforms so that you don't have land only owned by essentially the nobility. Um, and you begin to get ideas of being independent from England. And so 
we will see how that plays out in terms of the record shortly. But the first thing I want to talk about is knowing where they came from. And these are the, on the left are the divisions of administration. And two of them we're not going to really talk about because they don't involve the records. So a town land is the smallest administrative unit. It wasn't a town. There wasn't really a government to it, but it was the um, essentially like a village within a parish. Um, the, there were roughly 64,000 of these, and they were standardized in the 1830s when the British Ordnance Survey um, did the first real maps of Ireland in detail. And supposedly, they were the amount that was needed to keep a cow, which means that the worse the land, the bigger the townland. So if you had really good soil to provide food for your cow, you didn't need that big. The townland wasn't that big. Um, these were organized into civil parishes. And here's where one of the things gets tricky is you get both civil and religious parishes. You know, so civil parishes really being more like what we think of as a, a town or a township. And the religious parishes were either Church of Ireland or Roman Catholic. And you could have cases where these overlapped and had the same name. They may have overlapped and had different names. That's all tough. Um, most records were kept at the parish level but they were then archived currently more at the county level. So you'll want to know if you can find it, the county, the parish, and if you're really lucky, the town land in the US or Canada before you try to look in, in um, Ireland. So that's sort of the background of that. So next, one of the things that happened and why many of us have Irish ancestry is that in the eight, late 1840s, the um, potato crop failed. It was a blight. It basically just you know, killed all the potatoes, which the vast majority of Irish who were poor subsistence farmers got most of their calories from. So part of what happened is if you look at this between 1732 and 1841, there are parts of Ireland that in this hundred year period had over six times, you know, anywhere from one to six times the population. And in the 1730s, you already had a lot of these people being subsistence farmers and you get this, where you've got, you know, areas where these dark colors are, you know, quintupling the population. Um, one of the things the famine did is it meant it went from, Ireland went from um, having roughly um, 8 million people in 1841, and emigration meant that by 1921, there were only 4 million people in Ireland. And in 1891, based on census records in other parts of the world, it was estimated that 43% of everyone who was Irish born and alive in 1891 lived outside Ireland. So you've got the population increase, you've got low literacy rates. If you look over here, all of these light colored ones you can barely see are where there's under 15% literacy. Um, in 1841, because it, at this point you really don't have a great school system in place. Um, and so here we'll look at this. Um, and again, they, it varies. You get um, around Belfast, you had 
um, about 80% literacy, whereas when you got to the West Coast, you had about 80% illiteracy. Um, the other thing they did in the 1841 census is the census takers used various criteria for deciding whether a house, you know, a dwelling unit was considered first, second, third, or fourth class. And if you look here, this is almost the opposite of that literacy map. And you get all of these darker areas are where over two thirds of the housing was classified as fourth class, which is the worst housing. And here's a fourth class housing unit. This one's actually a little on the fancy side because it has a window. Yeah. Many of these didn't have a window. The family would have shared it with their cow and a couple sheep and maybe a pig if they were at the upper end of the economic status here. Um, and here are some more examples. As you can see, some of these aren't even stone. They're just sod put together. Um, so you can, you know, this is what would have classified as fourth class housing. And so you already have people who were living in not great conditions. Um, and so again, here you look, these two poverty measures, here you have and it really clear that the West half of Ireland has the fourth class housing and the illiteracy rates. So this is the context of what happened with the famine. Everybody got that at this point? Um, so the potato blight actually started in continental Europe and only hit Ireland um, by the end of that summer. Um, it had started in late May, early June in, in Belgium and parts of Germany. And it's not until about September that it starts in Dublin. And that has a couple of problems. One is it didn't give them time to plant anything new. Um, but as I said, most of these people were subsistence farmers um, relying on the potato for much of their calories. Now, here's one of the interesting things. During the famine, Ireland was actually a net exporter of food. Farmers in Ireland were still growing food to be exported to the English market, and the British army defended the ports and the supply lines to get this farmed food out of Ireland. So that's a big whole part of the, the story of why people had to leave and why you end up with some of the later 20th century issues is some of this did split along religious and political lines. So here's an estimate from the first couple of years of the famine, looking at um, number of deaths more than would have been expected statistically. And as you can see, there are places where you're getting way more deaths than you'd expect in this first couple of years. Um, and here's the population decrease in the 10 years between the 1841 and the 1851 census. You get three little areas, Belfast, Dublin, and Cork, that have increases in population because of people moving from the countryside to the cities to try to find work. And the rest of the country is quite depopulated. And many of the people left were starving. They were in, many went into poor houses where the death rate was very high and so on. Um, so you do have some pressure after this for um, land reform. So people won't be as um, vulnerable because at the point of the famine, almost all of the Irish tenants didn't really have a lease. Like 90% of the country was living month to month on farmland. And so you do get some beginnings of, of land reform in the late 1800s. It's violent. Um, it feeds into the independence movement and so on. So now we end up, you get the Easter Rising and the start of the, the real independence movement in 1916. Um, 
by 1921, Ireland is set off instead of, you know, outside of, um, well, the 26 Southern counties are set off as the Irish Free State. Um, and you get then after that happens in Ireland, not Northern Ireland, the six counties that stayed part of the UK, you get um, a civil war. So you've had the war of independence and you had to get a civil war. So here's what happened, why I'm mentioning this. In 1922, civil war is happening and you get this. All of the records that government records, the Church of Ireland records, this, what was the surviving censuses, lots of probate records. We're in a building called the Four Courts in um, Dublin. And this was right next to where there was a munitions storage facility. And you can see what happened. And so, um, you get a fire. Here you see what happens to the building. Here's a little, here's the four courts. The, um, here's the public record office where all of these records were. And the um, munitions dump was right in here. It was not pretty. Um, so that's why we're missing a lot of records. It's why for a long time, people thought, you know, go back to Ireland, you can't trace a thing. And we're, we're getting that away from that a little. So accessing the records because of this cut becomes interesting because you have records missing because of that fire. Um, you have some early census records in Ireland having been pulped before World War I or right around the time of World War I for the paper during the war. And now you have a division between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And so there are records that are in Dublin. There are records that are in Belfast. And some records are in both. They were split. In other cases, one's a microfilm and one's the original. But there are also others where you have to go to one city or the other. And then there are things still in local control at various archives, libraries, churches, historical societies, and many counties have a heritage center where they've put stuff now. Um, but just so you can see, this is the National Library of Ireland, and this is the county library in Donegal, which is the most northwest, northwestern county, um, which is traditionally part of Ulster, which is mostly part of Northern Ireland now, but it stayed part of the Republic. So let's look at some of the records. Births, marriages, and deaths. Up until 1845, you get church records. I'm going to talk about these more in a bit. Um, starting in 1845, you get Protestant marriages registered civilly. And then in 1864, you get all other marriages and all births and deaths registered. So up until 1864, you're really only dealing with religious records except for Protestant marriages. Um, so I'm not gonna talk much about um, the Methodists. They tended to have itinerant preachers at the time period we're talking about. And some of those records have been preserved, but not all of them. They can be very hard to find, um, but they were also likely because the Methodists had grown out of the Church of England, you sometimes find them still having their um, baptisms and marriages in recorded in a, a Church of Ireland Anglican church. The Quakers, their records are similar to Quaker records in other parts of the world. And when I do the Quaker program in several weeks, we'll go over those. The Presbyterians tend to be in Northern Ireland from the um, plantation of Scottish settlers in the 1600s. They were discriminated against in some ways as much of, as the Catholics 
because many of the record of, of the laws dealing with trying to suppress Roman Catholicism were written so that it was anybody who wasn't Church of England or Church of Ireland. And so you get some Presbyterian lack of records because they didn't want to keep the records um, because of the various persecution. Um, so let's take a look. Um, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland called Prony has a wonderful directory of where records are. And here we have, this is County Tyrone, which is just into Northern Ireland. Here's the, um, the CI stands for Church of Ireland. It's the, the, the parish name, which diocese they're in. Since this is the Church of Ireland doing this, they're calling it Derry. Actually, sorry, I'm a little surprised they're not calling it London Derry, but the diocese is Derry. Um, so it tells you what's still left. These are film numbers at the public register office. And then they tell you what's still in local custody as well. So that's a very handy. So these are originals and then you've got microfilms as well. Um, so here's more in that same area. You have M for Methodist, P for Presbyterian, and then you have RC for Catholic, um, and then RP for Reformed Presbyterian. And so you can see this, it's a wonderful um, inventory but almost all of these records start no earlier than about the 1830s. You get the occasional 1820s, but there's just not that much before this point. There's another inventory um, done, and these color codes mean various things in terms of who has them. Um, some of them have been indexed and, and or just digitized at Roots Ireland. Um, it gives you all sorts of, you know, the name of the parish and, you know, what the record, you know, baptisms, marriages and deaths or burials. Um, and it tell, like here's National Archives of Ireland um, and so on. Earlier records destroyed. Um, there are cases where one set of the records was destroyed, but the uh, priest had not quite trusted the process. And it turns out there was a copy back in the parish. Um, so fairly on, early on with, oops, um, the Church of Ireland, they started these pre-printed forms which is nice because you make sure you get all the basics, but you don't have room for the parish priest writing in a grand, prominent grandfather's name or whatever. Um, and they, they don't record for these, the, um, the sponsors' names, the godparents' names, which can be a huge help. So these are Church of Ireland forms. And you see, we do get the mother's name in these but not her maiden name. You get the, the um, this is the baptism. So you get the birth date and the, the um, baptismal date. Here you have the, the burial date um, with the age. And so here's someone who lived to be 98 and here's someone who died at three. So um, you get the whole range there. For the Presbyterians and the Catholics, they didn't bother with pre-printed forms. You, these are two fairly nicely kept ones um, where you know, every, things are separated and you can kind of read it. I've seen many of these where everything is scrunched together and it's very hard to, um, to read. So tracking down Catholic Baptist, Catholic records can be interesting. There are some websites that are starting to that have started to index them. 
These came online for free at the National Library of Ireland, digitized but not indexed several years ago. And if you go to National Library of Ireland, this is sort of what you see to begin with. And if you know the parish name, you can just enter it. You can also use the map to focus in on where you're looking at, which can be really nice. If you have a parish name, but you want to know which parishes are around it, you get this. So here we're looking, I mean, so here you see Donegal. Um, and this is the border here, Derry, Tyrone, Armagh, Down, and Antrim. One, two, three, four, five. Maybe it's Monaghan, I think, is the other one that's part of Northern Ireland. So, you know, when you know, there's, no, oh, sorry, Fermanagh is, so, you know, you can see when, when, North, when the border was hard, there was just a tiny little way to get up to Donegal from the rest of Ireland. Um, but we can focus in, and here you see um, the various parishes. So let's look at one of these. So I'm not sure how this is pronounced. Kalakti, maybe? I probably should have used one of the ones that were, was easier to pronounce. Um, and so here's that parish. And if we click on it, it tells us it's part, that it's in Donegal, that it's part of the Diocese of Raffo. It may be called Bruckless or Brookleys or something like that. So they'll give you the alternates and then they'll tell you that they have the baptisms from 1845 to 1847 and then from 1850 to 1853. And then on this film, they've got the, the baptisms from 1857 to 1881. So that gets us into the civil registration at 1864. And then they have the marriages from 1857 to 1882. And you can do this for any of the Catholic parishes. As I said, these are, these are available online for free at the National Library of Ireland. And you guys know me by now that Free makes my little Scots Yankee frugal heart very happy. Um, most of the Catholic records, you get these. Here you have the child's name, the parents' names, and then the the baptismal sponsors, witnesses, um, godparents, whatever you want to call them. And like with almost anything else with this, you want to keep track of these because they are often, you'll end up with names on these that turn up in maternal lines. Does that make sense to everybody? It's not unusual to get a mother's sister or a mother's aunt as one of these people. And you know, when you have some of the lack of records we have for Ireland, you want to take down everything you can. So civil registration starts. Here's the marriage from 1864. Um, you get the date of the marriage. You get the two people's names. You'll see this says full age. That means they were 21 or older. I have more than once seen it where instead of saying full age, they write 21. So if you see 21, they may or may not be um, 21, they may be 21 plus. Bachelor and spinster, I'm pretty sure this actually says sailor because if you look at the Sophia and spinster, I think that's his S, this clerk. Um, you get where they resided at the time of marriage. And this is really important because you get the town land um, and the parish name. You only get the father's name the way you did in England, unlike how you, it happened in Scotland where you got the mother's name as well. Usually you only get the father's name. England changed that within only the last 10 years. And then you get the father's occupation. They were married at the register office. 
and it gives you the the name of the act that allowed that rather than a religious marriage um if they married in a church it will have that ch the church's name and say something like according to the forms of the catholic church um and then you get the two people who were married and 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 the two witnesses so that's a decent amount of information this is a death record um and same thing you get um the date of death and where it happened you get the name this is the one i'm interested in here edward arthur i'm pretty sure this is my several grandfather um he's he was listed in my couple greats grandfather as a bookseller and i think he my couple greats grandfather was sort of exaggerating i think that he probably was just some sort of peddler door-to-door -door salesman cause of death this is almost certainly his wife mary hood arthur you'll see that neither she nor the informant on the other one here were able to write their names but it does tell me this gives it a, their address at the time of the death. Um, so that's really handy because I have it nowhere else um, at the time of their death. I have it from a couple earlier records. The census, as I said, before 1901, it was either deliberately pulped for World War I or it was... Um, sacrificed in the four courts fire 1900 1911 survive they're online for free at the national library of ireland they have a special website for them um and you can see here it's nice it's these individual forms um the other thing that survives at the same place is ireland right before World War I started doing old age pensions. And because of the lack of pre-19 or 1864 birth records, people had to prove how old they were to be eligible. And one way to prove that was to have them find your, have the, the census office find your family in the 1841 and 1851 census records. And they did a search and those records were not burned um, and were not pulped. So those are still there. It's not quite all of them is my understanding, but it's a good chunk of them. So particularly if you have an unusual last name, you'll want to look at those because you may find something, you know, if you're like me and your ancestor went to Scotland or came to the US, you may not find um, your ancestor because they were no longer in Ireland for the old age pension but you may get lucky and find a sibling who was. And so that's something to be aware of. The other thing they did, you know, going back to sort of that idea of building quality, they also went through and um, took uh, the census of the building returns. These are linked to um, the, the individual one. So this had a link on the page that I could click through to this. It talks about the class of housing, um, how many people are living there, how many windows there are and so on. So that can be a nice, interesting little bit to see what else is going on in the neighborhood. So there are some other things that are census substitutes. Basically, these are things where people have looked for lists of people that help us put a particular person in a particular place at a particular time. So I'm gonna go through some of these um, just because they're interesting. There is a fairly early census for Protestant householders back in 1740 for Antrim, Armagh, Derry, Donegal, and Tyrone. The problem is that it's really hard to get back that far in order to connect to those family names. So the tithe appointment books are just what they sound like. They're determining the tithes that people, whatever their religion, had to pay to the Church of Ireland. And as you can see, again, they, they rate 
first, second, third, and fourth class land, and you have acres, rods, and perches. You have the person's name, how much they had, um, and then the the tithe they were due to pay on that. Um, this was the 1820s. These are canceled in late 1830s. They're based on the price of oats and wheat just before these started, so right around 1820. These are organized by town land. Um, they evaluate they evaluated the quality of the land. Some people were exempt. Um, many of the big landowners, the, the land that was directly worked by them um, and their staff were exempt, but a small potato patch was not. You had to pay a tithe on it. And the um, the big name in Irish history or genealogy, John Grenham says that by unfairly taxing the poor, these records are actually more valuable to us as genealogists because it's one of the few cases at this time in Ireland where you're actually getting the names of poor people. These originals of these are at the National Archives of Ireland. Um, some of these have started going online. Um, and there's microfilm for the, the counties of Northern Ireland at Prony. Um, if you happen to be there, but these are something that because they're a fairly discreet set, the, these are online and then it's the changes you have to go to see in person still usually. Griffith's valuation is another land valuation done in starting in the 1840s to the 1860s. And again, this is happening right around the time right through all of the changes because of the famine. And again, Grenham calls it a snapshot in the aftermath of a cataclysm because of the changes that happened with Irish society and life because of the famine. These are available online. They've been printed like this. There are then books that are handwritten that are changes over the decades. Um, and the evaluations and changes go up to 1868 for the Republic into the early 1930s for Northern Ireland. And those note changes in ownership, changes in building, anything that would affect how much tax somebody paid. Um, and as you can see, they've been printed up like this. Um, this website, Ask About Ireland, has a wonderful finder for this. Um, where you put in a name and identifying information, you can get, so this list of Mallard is where that Edward Arthur died. So I could go into this and see who's living there. Um, this is, again, from the late 1840s. So he died in 1872. He's not there at that time. But you can get a list here. So for example, this is from the parish of Kappa in Tyrone, and you can see there's a school, and then these people also live on the town land. And you can get the original pages. Um, and the part I really like about this is here's a map view, and you can use this to figure out which piece of land. So for example, maybe your ancestor is on piece 10 here. And the really neat part is, so here's 10, with the modern roads overlaid. And you can see there's a road here to access 10. And you can even do this with the satellite view from Google Maps. And here's piece 10. So that's, um, let's just say I've spent way too much of my life playing around with this. Um, it's really neat. So poor law records. Most of us had ancestors who were poor in Ireland. Um, you get you know, Irish families who can't pass, can't buy land, can't pass it down, can't have a, a lease on farmland longer than 31 years. And that's if they even have a lease and aren't just month to month, can get kicked off their land for nothing. Um, so 
In 1838, Ireland starts a new poor relief. Um, they very much model on the same system they do in England. There are 163 poor law unions around the whole of I the Irish island. So this is both Republic and Northern Ireland at this point. There's no, no what's called outdoor relief. If you wanted help, you had to go into the poor house which meant that you had to basically give up all your possessions, wear a uniform. They often, when somebody went in for the first time, shaved their hair to make sure they didn't have lice. Um, and so you get really horrendous conditions. Um, up to 25% of those admitted to the poor house in the first 20 years of this system died within a year of entering the poor house. Um, there are registers for these. Um, they're in local hands for the Republic. They're at Prony, the public record office of Northern Ireland for Northern Ireland, which is 27 of these 163 unions. Um, they will have the person's name, the townland or town they're from or the parish. Um, birth date, date they were admitted, their age, their family relationships, what denomination they belong to, and there was a space for punishments they received for breaking the rules. So a lot of information there. Um, as far as I know, these have not yet been digitized. I keep hoping they will be because they would be an excellent source of data. Um, one of the other census substitutes to go from this horrendously grim subject is dog license registers. Um, there are almost, well, it's over 7 million entries of dog license registers in the late 19th century in Ireland. And again, why is this important? Well, you have a person's name and a date and where they lived. So you have the townland in many cases or the, the, the village of Lifford and how many, the dogs they had. Um, so we know here that this John McDermott living in Drumlin had two dogs, a terrier named Pompey and a, a bull terrier named Captain. Um, so we have a colleague named Sandy owned by William Doherty in Port Hall. So some of it is nice. It's nice to see our ancestors as people, but this was done every year. Somebody had to pay the dog license fee. And so it's a once a year snapshot of where this person was living. Does that make sense to everybody? Why? they went ahead and digitized these. It's nice to have something to contrast with the poor law records, trust me. So there are lots of other records here. Um, I don't have time to go into a lot of these, but I'm going to sort of briefly go through them. Um, there are police records um, going through things like you know, the, the disruptions because of the famine, and then later because of the land reform and then the entire um, War of Independence, Civil War, you've got all sorts of police records with the, um, they were calling it a, a decade of, of centenaries from 1915 or 14 or so till next year, um, because you get all of these things with World War One, and then with the War of Independence and, and the Civil War, um, Ireland was doing a big push to get a bunch of the stuff from that decade digitized. And so I'll show you some court and prison records in a minute. Um, occupational records. Um, so the police records are about offenders. The occupational records are the men who worked for the police. Um, the post office was actually about the biggest employer at the time the Republic became independent. And what's interesting is it was also one of the few institutions that both Catholics and Protestants 
trusted. And so they took on a lot of banking um, stuff we think of as like Western Union and credit unions and so on. Um, bill paying services went through the post office because it was the least untrusted institution. Um, Army records before 1922 are going to be in the National Archives in London. You do get many Irish young men joining the British Army the same way you did in Scotland, even though it was controversial to work for the English Army, but it was a steady income. And if you were starving, you might take it. If you were son number six and had no hope of land, you might do it. The great estates papers are, are the um, paperwork involved with these huge estates owned by dukes and earls and, and um, big, uh, you know, rich merchants and such. Um, most of those are not online, but they can be very handy if you are, um, if you can track them down because it does have histories of rents and tenants and all of that. Um, and I'll get to Will's probate and deeds in a minute, but let's take a look at some of the court records just to, um, this is the local petty session record. So petty coming from petite, um, and you will get who is the defendant, who's the plaintiff, um, the judge, what happened. You, um, so you get the, um, the, the charge and you get um, what happened. So you get fines. Early on, you get transportation to Australia or even earlier to Georgia. The, the now U.S. state, not the European country. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, I mean, on these petty session records, let me tell you that a couple ancestors of mine I found or relatives of mine I found in these really live up to the drunk brawling Irishman on Saturday night. Um, disturbing the peace fighting, being drunk in public. There's a lot of that. So don't be surprised if you find, and those are usually they'd have to pay a fine and the first few times. Um, there are also prison registers. And again, you know, you get the person's name, you get a description, why they were sent to prison, um, where they were from. And, um, what happened? Did they die in prison? Did they leave? Um, and so on. Um, and again, a lot of people get sentenced to, you know, three nights in prison for being drunk in public. Um, and again, these are, you know, these are kept at either the county or national level. So they are, in a lot of cases, just at the national level, which means they were easy to be digitized because they, you know, or microfilm because somebody could go in and do it and not have to go to every little church through the countryside. Now, okay, I wasn't quite sure. I'm, I'm not really going to talk about um, wills, probate, and deeds for a couple reasons. One is many of those burned in the 1922 fire. And the other is that almost none of us We'll have ancestors who folk who were in those. Um, you find very small percentages of there are some indexes left, for example, of probate materials because they were printed, published. And what you'll find is it's a tremendously small percentage of the population. And the chances are pretty good that if your ancestor had enough money to um have a deed or probate file that your ancestor didn't leave Ireland, unless maybe it's like the 11th son in a family. So um, since I'm running close to the end here, I, I just wanted to mention that in passing. I'm not saying you don't look, but you just it's not part of the beginning stages of looking in Ireland. 
The other thing I do want to talk about is name. Oh, here's another pr prison register just to see. So you get um, person's name. Notice the first three of these are for drunkenness. I was not exaggerating that they picked people up for being drunk. You get begging, drunken disorderly drunkenness, um, and so on. Um, this one I have because the victim here is a Bernard McGee, and I'm trying to find my Bernard McGee, and I don't know anything about him, so I can't tell if this is him. Um, sentence, in this case, it's a number of days and a fine where, where they were tried. Their description, remember, this is essentially, you know, by 1879, you have photography, but it's horrendously expensive. So you, they're not giving, doing photographs yet. So you get a detailed description when they were committed, um, who the judge was, um, how discharged, you paid fine, um, expiration of their sentence, where they were from. Um, trade or occupation. You'll notice this first one's a prostitute. Um, and here's another couple prostitutes. You've got laborers um, and so on. So, and then some remarks. Um, here's someone who's blind, who actually got brought in for um, drunkenness. So um, someone had another warrant. Um, someone had, is missing a left arm. So you can see that these have some, some value if you find one of your family members in it um, to get some description past birth, marriage, and death records. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is names because it can be an issue. There's a very small pool of given names used. You're going to find in a community maybe. 20 first names for men and 20 first names for women used. And it'll vary some within a family. It's wonderful getting that, you know, the occasional, um, I thought it was going to be, I was working on a friend's family and I'm like, oh, a Cornelius, that's going to be great. There's no, well, in that part of Cork, every family had a Cornelius. I'm assuming it was some local saint's name. Um, so you're going to be want to be really careful that the Patrick Murphy you find is the Patrick Murphy you want. Um, and you're going to you, you know, you're not going to be able to make an argument that, well, you know, this family has a Cornelius. It has to be the same one who has a kid named Cornelius. When you look in the church records and one of every 12 boys is named Cornelius. Um, one of the other things I found interesting when I was in Ireland and was reading, and I, this has continued with reading things online now that some of this has come online. In the early to mid 19th century, and this is anecdata, you know, I haven't done an absolutely rigorous test of this, but I have looking at the parishes I've looked at from about 1800 to 1860, if somebody had a middle name, more often than not, they were from a Presbyterian family. Um, you know, would go pages in a Catholic or Church of Ireland baptismal register without a middle name, whereas there'd be several on a page in the, the Protestant uh, or in the Presbyterian records for the same area. And the other thing is some surnames, many surnames are actually localized. So, for example, my Arthur's, this is where in 1901 in the census, there are families with the name Arthur. Um, or this is another way of looking at, this shows the actual parishes. This one shows you at the county level. So my chances are pretty good, just statistically, that if I didn't know that my Arthur ancestor was from the Donegal Tyrone area that I'd want to start looking there and not down here in Waterford and Cork because you know the ch you know, the chances are just better um I've been able with this 
I actually did finally find the Edward Arthur marrying Mary Hood record in a church record. Um, fortunately, they married in the Church of Ireland in a parish that the records had not been sent to Dublin to end up burning. But I was able to cross-reference her surname Hood with his Arthur that are both a little unusual in Ireland. And the only place they really overlapped was right here. And it turns out they are from the parish. They got married in the parish that's right here. And they lived in the parish that's right here. So it got me in the right place. And even names that we think of as stereotypically Irish. Here's a distribution from Griffith's valuation of people, men named Ken, or mostly men named Kennedy, which tells you, A, it's all over Ireland, but there are some areas where it's more common. Um, you see the same thing with names like Murphy and Sullivan. Um, and O'Connell, they are around the country, but you will get some clumping. Um, and so it's not really going to help that much with, you know, a Murphy or a Sullivan, but there are some names that, for example, when we get to one thing in a couple minutes, you'll see that there are a bunch of names that are concentrated up here in Donegal. So next question. Can DNA help? Yes. Why DNA can, in my case was exceedingly helpful uh, or not exceedingly, but it, it was very helpful. Remember, this is your straight paternal line. And here's the issue I had. It, those of you who've been around a while probably remember me talking about my great grandfather, Peter McGee, who became Peter Jameson. Well, McGee is one of those names that can be either Presbyterian Scots-Irish or Catholic-Irish. And so I was pretty sure they were Catholic-Irish because Peter was baptized in a Catholic church before he was adopted, when he was still with his birth parents. Francis and his wife, Helen Cassidy, had their marriage in the Catholic church and all you know, 11 of their kids, seven or however, seven kids baptized in the Catholic church. So I was pretty sure that they were Irish Catholic, not um, Presbyterian Scots-Irish. But what really firmed it up for me is um, my dad had done a DNA test for me before he died. And then the company went under. So my brother was nice enough to do another one. And his closest matches are all named names that McGee, Gallagher, Blaney, Donahue are all you know, concentrated in those name things up in the Donegal, slightly into Tyrone and Fermanagh, but really in Donegal. Fahey and McCann are a little wider into Fermanagh and Tyrone, but again, the, the chart, you know, those name things shows them up um, in that Northwest corner of Ireland. So this is telling me that um, there's a pretty good chance my paper trail sending Francis McGee back to probably somewhere right along the Donegal Fermanagh um, County line is right. Um, so autosomal DNA, um, which is what most of us have had done um, can also help. It tends to go back about five to seven generations that gets us to the early 19th century. And like people with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry and African-Americans where the paper trail doesn't disappear completely, but fairly well peters out before about 1850, what's happening, and this is happening to me with the McGee's who went to Edinburgh, because they were too poor to cross the Atlantic after the famine or during the famine and went to Edinburgh instead, you're getting right at the edge of dealing with what autosomal DNA can show you. But I do have a case where I've tracked a bunch of matches 
back through paper trails that go back to a couple Scottish, not Irish, but married in 1785 in Southern Scotland. And I'm closing in on a group that may well go back to a couple who married about 1810 in Ireland. And the advantage to that is a couple of their children survived long enough to have good death records or they married a second time when they were in their 60s. And so they've got their father's name on the second marriage record that I can then use to correlate stuff. So, you know, don't get discouraged if you are um, back to the famine. You may be able to get this done with, you may be able to make some connections with DNA. Can't guarantee it. I have an awful lot of paternal relatives where it's pretty clear they're descended from somebody who lived in the late 1700s that I'm descended from, that were at that seven-ish generations, and it's just outside the paper trail. And we will probably not be able to figure out how we're related, other than I know it's you know a particular quadrant of my family tree, not that who it is exactly. So I did it in an hour, guys. This I'm impressed. This one usually takes me an hour and 20 minutes, but that's in person when people are interrupting me. So any questions? Yes. You had a colored, coded church records. Where did you get that? That is from Prony. Um, let me pull it up and I'll show you. Where is it? Um, it's going to take a minute. It, I thought it was downloaded and it's saying it isn't. Come on, people. But I could do it this way. If you just Google um, crony, you can let me share this so you can see what I'm doing. Um, crony Guide to Church Records. And we'll accept the cookies. And. Oh, they've added this. But yeah, this this is a huge file. But it's got... Come on, computer. You can do this. Um, oh, this is not the one I wanted. I don't think. This is not the one. This is the first one that had the this I showed you, but there's also um where is it? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's this one. It's one of these. Um, you think I'd know by now. I okay, use it like- well, That's fine. I just didn't know where it came from. Yeah. I'll stop sharing and, and find it. And then when I find it, I will share again. Let's see. Um, other questions while I'm fussing around with this? I had a question. Sure. 
Um, do you know when the last week Zoom is going to be available on YouTube? I missed it and I wanted to re-see it. Um, probably tomorrow. That's my, um, that's my goal is to get that and a couple others up tomorrow. And it um, was the record not in English, right? Yes. Okay, so hopefully tomorrow then? That's my plan. Okay. Um, Thank okay. you so much. And next week it's Italy? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is really annoying me because I open it all the time, but it's not coming up on my computer. So... Have you run across uh, a list of those that settled the plantation of Ulster? There is not a list. Um, there is. Um, that. Unfortunately, there were too many. And no one kept a list at the time. Oh, and now after I've done all of that, it looks like it's going to open right up. Okay. Here we go. Let me share my screen again. Um, so, yeah, this is only the Church of Ireland, this fancy color-coded one. Although I think they do cover some others. But, again, this is um, the Church of Ireland Parish Registers. And you can see they go through, and here's the color code. The originals are owned by the church still, um, lost, but subsequent materials are located and are either at the, the church library or prony, um, completely lost, um, no color in, in local custody. And you can see it's... This is 98 pages of detail on the Church of Ireland. So this one covers all of Ireland, both the Republic and the and Northern Ireland, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, and you know, so it's it's a really handy document. Um, as is that other one that's the the um, the one with the blue tinge that I showed you. So that you know, they're, they're, they've really in the last five years started doing a much better job of getting records online and or finding aids for the records that aren't online yet so you know at least that they exist and you can try to get help accessing them does that make sense you know it took a while they were way behind some other countries in europe but they finally and yeah so there is this also that's the um this is prony and it's the churches in Northern Ireland um, that I had the snippet from that had the different denominations. Um, so between the two of them, you can usually, um, especially for the Northern half of Ireland, um, figure out what's available still. Um, and there has been a real effort in the, again in the last five to ten years to figure out what is in local custody and get it put into um, these guides in a way that didn't happen before. So, any other questions? Okay, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>